Okay. Good evening, brethren. Welcome to the eighth web series of Transoceanic Masonic Study Circle. As usual, uh, may I request all the participants to mute their microphones except for the speaker and for Right Worship Brother Bharatipur. Uh, after the presentation, we will have the question and answer session. I request those of you who would like to question the speaker on the subject that he's presenting to use the chat window. The questions will be picked up by Right Worship Brother Bharatipur and addressed to the speaker. Thank you, and um, request you all to cooperate. If possible, when the presentation is on, please stop your video feed too. So this will give us enough bandwidth uh, for the presentation. Over to you, Right Worship Brother Bharatipo. Thank you, Worship Brother Shankar. A very good evening to all of you, my dear brethren. Uh, it's a pleasure that you have come back for the eighth episode of the Transoceanic Masonic Studies Circle. You recall we started this uh, virtual meeting sometime in the middle of last year. We had uh, six episodes last year. The seventh episode was January this year. And it was a monthly uh, series up till then. In January, we decided to make it a quarterly series. So this is the eighth episode in the month of April. And we have had a lot of distinguished people speaking about various aspects related to masonry. And today we welcome in our midst in Masonic terms, a young mason, but in terms of knowledge, quite a gray-haired man indeed. So now we are talking about a person with virtual hair, a virtual gray hair. <laughs> and it's, uh, let me introduce him to you. Brother Raja Chaudhary is a National Film Award winner. His specialty is making documentaries. He's an architect. He's a public speaker, he's a spiritual teacher, and he designs multimedia installations and events and websites, and he has also been a recipient of the Webby Awards. He was educated at London's Architectural Association School of Architecture and went on to become a filmmaker as well as a digital producer. Some of his films include Spirituality in the Modern World, the Modern Mystic, The Quantum Indians, which went on to win the 2014 National Film Award in India. Yoga Aligning to the Source, and this was incidentally the UN's official global film, celebrating the very first International Day of Yoga, as was propounded by the Prime Minister Narendra Modi. He's currently producing a new film with WTTW Chicago, which is the public broadcasting service, PBS of America, and it's called America's First Guru. This is his tribute to Swami Vivekananda and its arrival of yoga and a concept and idea of Hinduism into the popular American subconscious. Now, uh, just a few words about this particular thing after his presentation is over. Because I would like to, uh, you know, talk a little bit more about his new project. And uh, as far as masonry is concerned, my brother, as I said, is young in masonry. He's a master mason in Lodge East and West, number 127, in the Grand Lodge of India, New Delhi. And he has uh, been a mason since 2015, so he's, as I said, young in masonry. Despite that, he has been exalted into the Royal Arch, in Chapter Sunda Hira, and he's also in the Rose Cross Chapter Lucas, number three, under the Supreme Council of the Ancient and Accepted Rite for India. He has been a student of Masonic and Esoteric history since he first discovered the path, so to speak. And how did he discover the path? Because he laid his hands on Umberto Eco's book, Coco's Pendulum. Those of you who have not read it, please do read that and also its predecessor book, The Name of the Rose. And he also wrote, uh, wrote, read the book, The New Atlantis. And that is the inspiration for today's talk, From New Atlantis to New Delhi. Over to you, Raja. Thank you, sir. Thank you, brother. Good evening, brethren. I, I'm honored to be here and thank you, brother Bharat, for inviting me to present this talk. And I wanted to just start by saying that 
we human beings are essentially different from our brethren monkeys in that we are pattern recognition creatures and we are storytellers we love we see patterns in everything we see sacred in everything we see unusual patterns that's why we are so successful but we are also remarkable storytellers because we keep our traditions and our knowledge alive through stories and what i wanted to share with you today is a story that starts way back in ancient egypt goes through francis bacon and ends up in new delhi which is quite a journey we're going to take and the other part of it is a a story of pattern recognition that how we came to see the correspondence of the stars and the in our beings in ourselves and in the work and our architecture and our cities so i want to start with this and today's talk is called i'm just share my screen just give me a second my talk is entitled from new atlantis to new delhi sir francis bacon and the making of a brave new world so what i wanted to do is i will start by continuing where i started just now that we are essentially a pattern recognition creature now the greatest example of this was in ancient egypt where from at least 2500 bc onwards we see architecture city civilizations buildings that reflect such a high knowledge of astronomy of arc of uh, mathematics of uh, correspondence of, of understanding and in fact the ancient civilization of egypt was known as kem and that is where we get the name alchemy from that it came out of kem and if you look at the three pyramids of giza they are actually perfectly aligned to orion's belt and this unusual obsession with sirius and the dog star and the duats and the different movement of the heavens and gave us the paradigm that we came to know as as above so below and in fact they saw correspondence in everything they saw the nile as the milky way they saw the the pharaoh's destination that they came from sirius that they were it was a continuous knowledge but if you had asked them where they got this knowledge from they said it came from a very ancient people before them that gave them this knowledge and this is what we came to know as atlantis later and they gave the credit to a god called thoth and thoth was a uh, generally known as the great scribe and the architect of the sacred geometry of egypt and he gave us writing he gave us sacred geometry mathematics and later on for those of you who know these things he came to be known as hermes trismegistus or the thrice great hermes and he was hermes of rome he was hermes trismegistus of hermeticism and he is one of the key figures in the evolution of freemasonry and rosicrucianism as you will discover and he gave us geometries from everything from today what we know as the sephirot to seeing in nature the fibonacci sequence to seeing uh, the flower of life in fruits like the pomegranate and we see it throughout all architecture in solomon's temple we see it everywhere through the pine cone where we see the pineal gland and the biology of the pine cone and this idea of the sacred geometry really found its flowering literally in egypt at that time and when moses left egypt in the apparently around 12 or 1400 bc he was a high priest of this egyptian mystery school there was no doubt about that he was a prince of the of the pharaohs and he knew this mysteries and he took this mystery with him to israel to creating israel and through him to david to solomon we get this lineage of egyptian knowledge of mathematics of mystery and then integrated that with the sumerian knowledge of the chaldean knowledge later that brought together a new synthesis in israel at that time and when 
what we know about King Solomon's temple at that time is that these geometries, you know, the Fibonacci sequence, the, the golden ratio, as it's called, the phi ratio, the uh, work of or location of things in the spaces was critically done. In fact, even it was considered that the Ark of the Covenant, which was kept in the Holy of Holies, was actually designed with the sacred geometry of phi, which is called the Fibonacci sequence, the golden ratio. And the whole concept of it was that the Solomon's Temple, and if you look at it carefully, was the Holy of Holies was placed on the Western side because God, the, the light of God that descends from man to man is on the West, the rising of the mountain of greatness of, of, of all that can be great in God and the architect of the universe comes from the West. And when you look at the creation of the temple structure, which copied Egyptian ideas completely, and then later gave us the Sephiroth, we see that the placement of Boaz and Yaqim also, ironic, uh, funnily enough, relate to the Ida and Pingala in the Indian Kundalini system, is that Boaz, which was left as we are facing the temple, and Yaqim on the right, was one represented the, the, the willpower and strength and severity of power required to build a greater world, a better man, to build a better man. While the other side, which was the heart on the right side facing us, was considered to be mercy and creation and the establishment of God's kingdom here on earth. And when you see that you understand that you're entering the gateway into the mysteries and then climbing up the 33 steps to the great God of the architect of the universe, you are actually seeing the human body as a metaphor, as below, as a macrocosm, microcosm of the macrocosm above. And this is fascinating stuff. And we get that through Egyptian dynasties start fading around the 12th century. And the Greek civilization comes into full force around the uh, third and fourth centuries BC, so 300, 400 BC. And we get, you know, Socrates first, Pythagoras, Socrates, all the great, what became known as philosophy. And philosophy means literally the love of Sophia. And Sophia is the goddess you are seeing on the screen here, is the goddess of wisdom. Sophia means knowledge, wisdom. That means we human beings are the center of the search for the answer to the key to give us the key we need to open those locks and mysteries that open up the universe for us. We are the center. So philosophy was the great large transition moment when man went from being at the mercy of the gods to defining the terms and conditions upon which man will create the new world he lives in. Now, Plato, who was the greatest philosopher of his time and gave us platonic solids and geometries, learned a lot from, the, from ancient Egypt. And he brought a lot of that knowledge from Egyptian mystery schools. He studied in Egyptian mystery schools. And he, in one of his writings right, uh, at the time called Timaeus, he wrote this wonderful treatise where he, he described an ancient civilization they, they dated from the writing that about 10,500 BC that lived somewhere in the West, a great Western kingdom. It could have been in the Atlantic Ocean. It could have been in the Pacific Ocean. It was a great Western country that was an island culture of highly advanced civilization, regulation, rules, philosophy, science, culture, technology. It was wonderful. But it had declined and it tried to invade Athens and it was defeated. And by some cataclysm, it fell into the ocean and disappeared. This he called Atlantis. And it, this, the idea was that knowledge was lost and then it was reborn in Egypt and came to the Greeks through Pythagoras and Socrates and Plato. And now was in the world to become the new philosophy of reason and thinking and logic and art and beauty and creativity. 
and seeing in the sacred geometries, and he describes five sacred forms, the platonic solids they're called, which are embedded in each other, as you can see from this lower image here, that at the core is the universal sun, the being, the, the, the sun and the moon, the, the, the duality of me in the perfect world. And each step outward from me is a sacred geometry. And it forms what is called the nested platonic solids. So a lot of the architecture of the classical period is built on these concepts, as well as the circular shapes you see of Atlantis that he proposed as the perfect utopian civilization. Now, what happened then was that by the Greek period of uh, Egypt, the Greeks took over Egypt with the Ptolemy family. As you know, the great Ptolemy was Cleopatra. And Alexandria, the city on the, on the Nile, on the ocean, on the, the, the Red Sea, was the center of civilization in the Greek and Roman periods. So between 45 BC and 275 AD, Alexandria was the center of the known universe. People came from all over the world, discourses. You had a Jewish quarter, you had uh, Roman quarters, you had quarters for every culture. People lived harmoniously together. It had the greatest library known to mankind. All the mystery schools had their home there. So if you were a, a Freemason or a pursuer of wisdom, at that time, you would have been in Alexandria. And it is said that Jesus probably got a lot of his initiation there. And the great major schools that came out of Alexandria at that time were called Hermeticism. Then it was Neoplatonism, which was Plato's theories in a new way. Then it was Gnosticism. And then Christianity was an emerging force. And Buddhism was there. They were represented from well before from Ashoka, Ashoka's time that people had been sent to. And when Alexander came to India, he brought people back. So Buddhism was also part of the dialogues in that time in Alexandria. And we in Freemasonry get a lot of our knowledge from Hermeticism and Gnosticism and Neoplatonism. This is where we get it from and the Christian overlay of it all. Now, of course, the great darkness comes, the dark ages. And in 275, even though Alexandria had many, many fires and the library had been burnt, the, the massive fire destroyed all the knowledge of Alexandria and Alexandria literally fell apart. And the Christian church became a dominant force. And at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, the Emperor Constantine declared Christianity to be the religion of Rome. And that was the beginning of the end of the Roman Empire. You know, we saw Constantinople dividing up the empire into two parts, the, the, uh, the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic. And Alexandria was destroyed. And all these lovely teachings we saw, Hermeticism, Gnosticism, Neoplatonism, all were declared heretical and they had to go into hiding. Now, just imagine all these wonderful schools of wisdom that were available. Hermeticism talked about the teachings of thought and uh, Hermes, Hermes Trimagistus. Then Gnosticism talked the, teaching, the secret teachings of Jesus that we are God's children moving towards the light. He is the great architect of the universe, but we are veiled and cloaked from it by darkness and we have to overcome the darkness. All these wonderful theories, Neoplatonism that says that the world is full of beauty and aesthetic pleasure and dialectics and uh, science and possibilities, all this was vaporized in one go by the Church of Nicaea and declared heretical. And this was a huge problem that occurred. So we call it the Dark Ages in many ways. And when I, um, one of the things I wanted to share with you here is that the nature of that time was, saw two things. One was the rise of the Islamic empire, right? Out of Mecca into Constantinople, into right across Baghdad, the caliphates, the Sufi the sultanates of Moorish civilization in Southern Europe. So Islam became this large power from 622 onwards. But the, the Western empire became dark. The dark ages came about and the Roman empire declined, collapsed, and knowledge was gone from Europe. Knowledge was gone. And it started to come back. And this is where our story takes us now. And it started to come back into 
the first the crusades because around the early 1020s we see the first movement towards recapturing the promised land and the israel from the muslim rule and bringing back the knowledge and the gold and the wealth that they had all been you know because you can imagine that if you wanted to buy pepper or if you wanted to buy silk or if you wanted to buy anything in italy or in europe you were paying exorbitant rates to middlemen from the middle east arab traders muslim traders so the 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 popes the all decided that it was not possible and they wanted to destroy that and they wanted to take complete control of the trade routes themselves and that's when the crusades began and what happened was that the templar knights who were the knights given the task of capturing the, the temple of solomon and bringing it back to christendom became very successful at protecting and banking the routes of crusade of pilgrims that would go to the promised land and over a 2 300 period phase this idea of the templar knights became a huge financing force in europe and one of the greatest things they financed was the building of some of the most exquisite cathedrals mankind had ever seen from chartres to notre dame to westminster all were built during this 3 400 year period and as many of you would have heard the solomon guilds were the first guilds that actually freemasons and masons would work together and form guilds and they were called freemasons because of two reasons one they would work on the free type of masonry stone that could easily carve symbolic signs onto and glyphs and and creatures and 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 saints and all of that and they were also called freemasons because masons were the only ones who were allowed to travel throughout europe freely between kingdoms with just by having a paper or a scroll saying that they were freemasons they were masons so at that time we call that level of masonry speculative uh, sorry we call it operative masonry it means they were actually masons and this later goes on to develop into speculative masonry by the 14 15 1600s that we now know as freemasonry right okay another thing happens parallel to this now we're coming to the key moment of the, the story right the the renaissance renaissance begins in europe and why because after the crusades all these amazing manuscripts and scriptures are brought back from the arab lands from palestine from uh, syria from all over the old christendom and deposited in italy and in to the popes and to the medici family who one of the popes were from the medici family and the medici family of florence invested in the translation of these into latin and and other languages that could be understood from greek from hebrew from other languages and the two main texts that were translated by a man called marsilio ficino were the corpus hermeticum which we talked about in hermeticism the core teachings of thought and the hermes trimagistus magistus and the philosophies of plato and these two were translated and it is said that marsilio ficino said many have paid lip service to philosophy but these men served it with their whole heart he tastes nothing who has not tasted it for himself so without philosophy life has no meaning that means it's not enough to have faith alone one must approach it with reason and the revival of corpus hermeticum and hermeticism begins at this time and what you see here is a rebirth of alchemy remember alchemy means the teachings of ancient egypt the mystery schools of egypt begins between 1463 and 1600 first through the corpus hermeticum and all the teachings of the emerald tablet and people like isaac newton were translating it people were translating it and understanding it and the development of these seven hermetic principles the most important of which we know as the principle of correspondence which is as above so below as below so above but this idea that man could change any metal into gold but this was a spiritual journey of man going from base element to spirituality and by the the church had destroyed the early forms of corpus hermeticum and other teachings at that time 
But by the early 1500s, we start seeing the emergence of a secret society in 1614, later in 1614, called Rosicrucianism. And Rosicrucianism was the inheritor of the, all the legacies that we are talking about. Hermeticism, Gnosticism, uh, Neoplatonism, sacred geometry. And Rosicrucianism came about with a series of pamphlets and books by secret society because the church declared them heretical and would kill them if they were discovered. So they had to go underground and meet secretly and do secret things. And it was built, built, built based on the teachings of a man called Christian Rosenkreuz who was a mythological figure who had gone to the East and brought back ancient meditation techniques from Syria and from India and other places, brought them back to Europe, and he syncretically created this new reason-based philosophy called Rosicrucianism. Now, our story now takes us to England because John Dee was the great English alchemist, 1527 to 1609, and he brought these teachings back of Corpus Hermeticum to England, and he became Elizabeth I's greatest guide and astrologer, astronomer, cartographer. He was the ultimate Renaissance man. He drew maps, he was doing magic, he was uh, doing uh, forecasting, and he helped Elizabeth build her great empire that began the rally and all going off to new worlds and conquering and doing all that stuff. And John Dee was, you know, there are songs about him in England. He is one of the Later on, he got a bit discredited as a magician, and, but his legacy was enormous. And he led to his inheritor was a man called Sir Francis Bacon. And Sir Francis Bacon, for those of you who don't know who he was, is the founder of the Royal Society. He was the true Renaissance man of England. He was the inheritor of John Dee's legacy. He, he created the humanist modern thinking we talk about the age of reason or the age of enlightenment he is the father of enlightenment in england and he brought rosicrucianism to england from france he was a founder of a very secret society called the, the knights of the helmet and this society it was said was the reason why shakespeare's plays were written so shakespeare and a group of others called edward de vere and others were all part of the secret society that he had Christopher Marlowe, and he had created, and he was just a polymath and an and a amazing man. And, and then he, but one of the most important things he wanted to do was he believed that a utopia could be created in the West, a new civilization, a new world based on these ideals of Rosicrucianism and Hermeticism and all these things. And he wrote a book called The New Atlantis. And this book was in 1626, very hidden secretive book that began to campaign aggressively for colonization, for the development of new forms of brotherhood, government, science, and whatever you can imagine. And he started, and while he was writing all this stuff, he was pushing the, the, the royal courts to colonize the world. He was pushing Walter Raleigh. He was pushing others to go and colonize Virginia, to go and colonize Newfoundland. In fact, his influence was so strong that Newfoundland declared him the founding father of Newfoundland and gave him a stamp at that time. You know, it was wonderful. And the New Atlantis, the book, was a phenomenal book. It painted a picture. Now, just bear with me, brothers. It painted a picture that of uh, this group of sailors heading through the Cape of Good Hope, through Peru, are sailing around Americas, and they get lost at sea in the Pacific Ocean. And they are rescued by these advanced sailors and technologies from another group of people of an island they discover called Ben Salem. You know, think of it, Ben as in newborn, and Salem, as in Jerusalem, you know, this was the new Salem. And Ben Salem was a amazing, just like Plato's Atlantis, it was a highly evolved civilization. It had reason and it was a republic. Everybody was equal, humanist, progressive, democratic, equality, scientific, superstition-free, tolerant of religions. And it was said in the book, it says, 
generosity and enlightenment, dignity and splendor, piety and public spirit were the underpinnings of the new Atlantis. And at the center of the new Atlantis was a secret society called Solomon's Temple. Does that sound familiar? Solomon's Temple, Solomon's Temple. And it was headed up by a man called Jabin, who was the father of the, the grand master of, of the lodge of Ben Salem. And he gave them medicines, he gave them new science, he gave them technologies, and then they went on their way. But their arrogance forced them to leave the island. The book didn't finish. It kind of unfinished symphony in a way. But the idea was that man could not keep this beautiful knowledge to himself. It would destroy everything. But the symbolism that came out of that changed everything we know. And if you think about it, all the earlier symbols got condensed together. And we get the hexagram of correspondence of as above, so below, Boaz and Yaqim, the key of Solomon. We get the two pillars of Boaz and Yaqim. We get the tree of life. We get the sephirot of the ideal alchemical perfection. That means man is at the bottom of the sephirot and God is at the top. And in between are the higher levels of being. And this forms the structure of the perfect man that we are always trying to become better men. And we aspire to climb up the ladder. And this ladder, which many in the uh, esoteric groups of Freemason will know, represents Adam Kadmon, the perfect man. And if you look at the shape of the new Atlantis that he had drawn, it is a pentagram. And the pentagram here represents the word of God made spirit into man by overcoming the elements of the earth. So you have sacred geometries that include a pentagram. By the way, an upward pointing pentagram represents aspirational to God and a downward pointing pentagram is devil and Satan in that way. So the upward pointing, you'll always see it in Freemasonry. Is the, and in, if you think about this, this leads to Leonardo da Vinci's great painting as well. So just imagine all these sacred geometries which we have now know and so see in everything were developed and refined during this period. So what happens? Now, just imagine that the Royal Society is formed. Christopher Wren, the great architect, Sir Isaac Newton, all these amazing people join the Royal Society, form brotherhoods, which we now call Freemasonry. You know, the lodges didn't form till the 1700s. But we get to see the birth of sacred geometry, creating a new Atlantis or a new Jerusalem here on Earth. And when they had the great fire in 1666, Christopher Wren proposed that there be some kind of rebuilding of London. But this never happened correctly. And we see that it was a, a beautiful idea with the two towers of Boaz and Yaqim, the, the, the holy of holies in the middle in the cathedral. And here the cities would just be full of aspirational spires reaching for heaven so that we create a glorious civilization. This was the first effort. Paris also tried, but didn't make it. So we see here that, now this is the, where the interesting thing begins. Bacon pushes the new colonies to form in Virginia and Newfoundland starting in 1606. And very early on, Rosicrucians inspired by Bacon moved to Philadelphia, to Boston, to Newfoundland. And you, they don't become colonists, they become influencers. So they start doing printing presses. They start teaching scientific ideas. They become doctors. They become healers, all kinds of things. And I want to share one thing with you, which is a little known fact, that they arrived here and in Newfoundland up here at first, the colonists. But if you look at where they set up, it was in Penn Philadelphia that most of the activity occurred most of the, the, the revolutionary activity later and everything happened in Philadelphia. The first printing presses, the first thinking, Benjamin Franklin was there. There he is over there. And if you draw a line from Pilot Mountain in South North Carolina all the way to Newfoundland and you draw, it's called the Masonic line. If you draw a line, this line just coincidentally goes through Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, Princeton, uh, Boston, and then Newfoundland. I mean, talk about 
influence of Rosicrucian thinking and sacred geometry in the making of America. This is a very beautiful example of that. So the first colonies came, they settled down here, then they started spreading, and smaller colonies started in Philadelphia, in Boston, you know, later on, New York became a Dutch colony, that became English later. And the influence of Rosicrucianism was everywhere. So by the time we have the, the freedom movement, the revolution, the war of independence from the British, right? The founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, you know, were all Freemasons, you know, and the Committee of Five that was established, in fact, of the founding fathers, 14 were Freemasons of Scottish Rite and English lodges, all were there. And Benjamin Franklin was their leader, and so was Thomas Jefferson. And they, Thomas Jefferson said, that Bacon, Locke, and Newton, I consider them as the three greatest men that have ever lived without any exception and as having laid the foundation of those superstructures which have been raised in the physical and moral sciences. So America was going to become the new Atlantis. And if you read the Declaration of Independence, it reads like you're reading the new Atlantis. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if you go deeper, the parallels with the new Atlantis are magnificent. So that means the influence of Bacon thinking on Franklin, on Jefferson, and those early Rosicrucian thinking in America was tremendous. And if you go deeper, Washington, who was also a Freemason, became president in 1790. And he got the French Masonic architect, Charles L'Enfant, this gentleman here, to come and plan a new city. But he decided to not do it at Philadelphia, but in a land that he had acquired, which now we know as Washington, D.C. And he built a fantastic city. And in the eastern side, where normally would be the rising sun, he put the people, the capital, the People's Republic. And on the Western side, where the Holy of Holies would be, he put the obelisk, the rising spire of God. And then the White House was just there and all the other monuments came around that. But this axis that he created between the capital, the people's power, which if you see here, you see the sacred geometry is forming clearly of the compass and the square, and the obelisk right there. There's the obelisk on the Western Front. And there rising up, and it's on the mountain, and there rising up on the hill is the Holy of Holies right there. Freedom. And if you look at it carefully, the obelisk, which is the Holy of Holies of America, is right there, and it refers back to the Egyptian obelisk system we talked about. And George Washington's monument is an obelisk also. Isn't that wonderful? Now, one of the things that I wanted to show another piece of sacred architecture and serendipity that occurred is that Washington decided to buy the land at 77 degrees west of longitude. That means that for some reason he had decided that 77 represented the secret name of Christ and implies strength of fortitude in Hebrew. Originally meant to be Philadelphia, but Washington was superstitious about 77 and bought all the land he could there and sold it back to the American people. And if we draw a line around the world, there we go. New Delhi is right on 77. I'd spoken about this earlier. Now we go forward 150 years. Now, ironically, the republic that was born in America was meant to be a new Atlantis. Science, progress, religious freedom, tolerance, all of that wonderful stuff was going to happen. And so a new Atlantis was born and we see that birth. But ironically, when the new capital was planned for India and they were leaving Calcutta and they were going, they decided to move to New Delhi, which was a 77 degree parallel uh, longitude. And the they moved it to Delhi and the initial stages, I wanted to show you something. 
that Sir Edwin Lutyens and Herbert Baker were the architects chosen. And if you look carefully, you will see that Lutyens, who was also the son-in-law of the Viceroy, that's why he got the contract, was a more organic, nature-loving architect in England. He hadn't designed anything Masonic or monumental before in his life. And Baker, on the other hand, was the Masonic architect of South Africa and Kenya. He had built palaces, he had built monuments, he had built everything. So Baker was really major influence in the architecture of this. And if you look at the original group, they, Lord Hay Harding put together a group with the permanent secretary of Sir Thomas Holderness, who was a Freemason. He made, Lord Harding made him take Sir Edwin Lutyens, who gave us the, the, some of the beauty of design of Stupa, and, but put Herbert Baker as his counterpart and two major engineers to work on it, John A. Brody and S.C. Swinton, who were both Freemasons. And when they decided to design the city of Delhi, and I've done this before in my earlier presentation, you see a monumental generating principle based on Masonic ideals of as above, so below, that the secretariat where the administration would occur and on the Western Front would be the Viceroy's house, which would be the holiest of holies, ideally, on the Eastern Front would be the gateway to India, the, the conquering of all of India. On the North would be the traders. On the South would be the world of India to conquer. And this generating principle, you can see the sacred architecture forming from a simple hexagon into all kinds of pentagrams and all structures forming here as well. So this gave us a generating principle that gave us Delhi. And... What we see here is that Connaught Place, which is the central trading center of Delhi at that time and still today, was going to be in the north, the Viceroy's Palace in the west, where we'd have the Holy of Holies. The Secretariat Building would be the Gateway, Boaz and Yakim. The India Gate would be the Great uh, Eastern Front, you know, and, and the, the doorway to the Lodge, the Great Supreme Lodge. And the people would be in the north as well. This would be the people's secretariat, the, the Lok Sabha today. So there is the Lok Sabha, there is Kanat Circus, and there they are, the geometries. And you can see it again here. This was the great generating principle. And if you look carefully, it's multiple axes of hexagons and sephirots and all kinds of geometries you are seeing everywhere. Now, this is another picture of that hexagram in action. So when the idea was that these two towers, the secretariats now, North and South Block, would become the Boaz and Yakim, at the end of it would be the Great Holy of Holies with the Viceroy's Palace, and there would be a 33 degree steep that would take you to the Jaipur Tower that would bring you into the full form of... And, and ironically, as I said before, this hill was called Raisana Hill, which was actually the hill from which Indra Prash of the great Mahabharata Pandavas was built from there. So the coincidence of 77 degrees, the British setting up their center here, and Indra Prash was not to be taken lightly. There is some wonderful serendipity and sacred geometry at play here. And then when we go further, we see everywhere in Delhi, obelisks, and monuments and symbols that relate to those sacred geometries I showed you in Baconian philosophy. And while funnily enough, the British wanted this to be the center of empire, little did they realize that by building a new Atlantis at Delhi, they were actually going to build a new republic that was free of colonial rule. They were building the next America, ironically. And this irony has not gone lost to us that they gave us the gift of an architecture for democratic power. Isn't that wonderful? That wonderful idea. And just to, the, the trading side of it was also Masonic, where Connaught Circus was designed around the idea of Bath, where the region circle of Bath, and that today is the trading center of Delhi. And we are a trade nation of traders, just like the British were. We trade with the world, you know. And when India got its independence in 1947, 
a board of uh, you know and uh, by the way i wanted to show you other sacred geometries the sephirot does form in delhi and it's quite a beautiful sacred geometry across and we can go into this in a conversation later but i wanted to share this very interesting discovery with you that the indian constitution which was started a committee was formed in 1947 that was led by b r ambedkar right um, and if you read the indian constitution it reads like the american declaration of independence and it reads like a declaration of the new atlantis we the people of india having solemnly resolved to constitute india into a sovereign democratic republic and to secure all its citizens justice social economic and political liberty of thought expression belief faith and worship equality of status and of opportunity and to promote among them all fraternity how much more masonic do you get than that assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation in our constituent assembly this 26th day of november 1949 to hereby adopt and act and give ourselves this constitution and as it would be ambedkar ayer and khaitan were all freemasons so did we give ourselves a new atlantis in india and are we living up to that aspiration of being a new atlantis only time will tell my brothers and this is where i will close now thank you uh, brother raja choudhury wonderful presentation a time travel from new atlantis to new delhi covering sacred geometry and uh, wonderful of course uh, we will come to the discussion aspect later i i now request a uh, uh, brother in who have questions to please use the chat window and uh, uh, the questions will be picked up by right coach brother bharatipur and addressed to brother raja choudhury Uh, please be specific in your questions you can ask uh, how many ever questions you want but just be specific to the topic that he is presented thank you uma uh, lovely raja what can i say uh, just uh, i just noticed something that there were 77 participants in today's uh, webinar <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> the world does work in mysterious ways synchronicity and serendipity we are living pattern recognition car creatures <laughs> i talking about 77 i had the pleasure of living in philadelphia where i did my masters and and that was my first exposure to american uh, history and benjamin franklin uh, benjamin franklin was the one who founded university of pennsylvania where i right. started so so i had a, and i believe me, i didn't know about masonry then but i do everything about May, uh, about uh, benjamin franklin how i wish i knew about masonry then <laughs> that was a long time ago as another century altogether anyway uh, thanks for that wonderful uh, journey that you took us through from uh, the world of uh, atlantis to kem to israel to greece to alexandria to rome to france to london back to the new world and i ended up in our own dear country thank <laughs> you that is a wonderful travel log i'm sure everybody a, a tour de force <laughs> yes it was we also have yet another enterprise which is being this uh, commission or rather supported by the transoceanic masonic studies circle and that is something which i would like brother vikram balakrishna to talk about so brother vikram if you could please come on screen and talk about our new initiative on behalf of transoceanic masonic study circle thank you uh, right worshipful brother bharat and uh, uh, thanks first of all brother raja for this wonderful uh, journey you have taken us through and i think uh, speaking of patterns uh, which are emerging and you know some of the uh, topics which have been spoken of i think you have taken us through a wonderful virtual tour from new atlantis to uh, new delhi and that would obviously be many many uh, virtual thousands of miles and uh, kilometers or what not and uh, um, you know you also alluded to tour de france um, you know perhaps uh, as uh, an example you went uh, you know in terms of the uh, places which got covered and our uh, uh, community which has uh, you know transpired as as a consequence of um, many uh, virtuous circles which have uh, you know uh, similarly emerged whenever uh, uh, right watchful bharat uh, uh, right watchful brother bharat and watchful brother umar involved yet another uh, such idea 
came about when we uh, uh, met for one of our meetings of Lord Aranya Mitra, and we were speaking that uh, you know we have such a vibrant audience from world over, uh, and I mean brethren who are uh, uh, so capable and uh, doing a world of good in the trans oceanic Amazonic study circle. Now, why not uh, we uh, come up with something to add to a greater good? Why not come up with some uh, a sort of a fitness challenge of sorts, which can be organized virtually, where uh, brethren can participate uh, by contributing and clocking any activity. I mean, all of us do end up walking, uh, if not for outdoors, at least indoors between, you know, uh, uh, our uh, bedrooms to living room to kitchen. So everything counts and our smart devices today capture uh, most of these activities. And if we are able to uh, sign up for uh, some cause or multiple causes through a program which we are uh, soon to launch uh, through many platforms like Lifecycle or similar, and uh, um, also flaunt uh, a beautiful uh, T-shirts which is uh, being designed for our Transoceanic Masonic Study Circle. Uh, I think um, uh, we shall be able to uh, um, do a lot more and uh, deliver the right kind of impact uh, which we all uh, choose to give back. And and um, you know on on another note. Um, you also mentioned Brother Raja about Guinness, and I was, um, uh, you know, I think uh, hearing some time back that Guinness is uh, uh, listed as one of the uh, best post-workout beers as well. So maybe I mean we can look to source that uh, in the whole package. And uh, but you won't get you won't get a six pack. You won't get a six pack. <laughs> <laughs> you won't get a six pack. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, uh, I'm, fact, I'm from Bangalore. <laughs> I'm from Bangalore. We we can like you know ensure that uh, it it gets um, you know transformed into some sort of six pack in one way or the other, <laughs> right? So um, yeah, I mean, this is the whole concept, and uh, we shall soon uh, come up with the entire details. It will pan over a, a period of a month uh, or a longer. I mean, uh, we'll just see the most conducive time to launch it given the current situation, um, which is rather unfortunate, but yet allows us to have uh, the kind of, you know, fun and uh, brotherhood and fraternal bonding, which we always choose to do. Uh, so with that, uh, I, you know, uh, hand it over back to Right Worshipful Brother Bharat to add his views and uh, then take on the questions, uh, which I think many brethren are very eagerly willing to ask now. Thank you, Vikram. Uh, so, brother, you heard that a, a new initiative we are planning as far as this uh, platform is concerned. And we shall be sharing that information shortly once we tie up the loose ends and we seek your uh, support uh, It's for a greater cause, greater good. And I'm sure we'll all step up to the bat. Now, coming back to the today's presentation, uh, I, I, from the comments that I've just been reading on the chat box, brother Raja, you've floored everybody. <laughs> I promised you a two de four, so it's a good one. <laughs> Congratulations. So, incidentally, the first question, uh, it obviously it has to go to uh, Vashpur brother Sanjay Ranganathan because he's always in a quick off. Thing. So, let's see what he has to say. Uh, his question, brother Raja, is Is the purpose of the Platonic myth in New Atlantis? to instill hope that this knowledge can be recovered and the state of civilization excellence restored. Question is, can this platonic myth in Atlantis instill hope that this knowledge may be recovered yes. and civilizational ex excellence be restored? Well, I, if we look carefully at the writings of Bacon and before him Plato, we do not see an obsession with a golden past like we have, let's say, in India, for example. We do not have such an obsessive nature in Plato or in um, Bacon later. What they do want is a better future, a progressive future. So it was. So if you think about what emerged out of Baconian thinking in Europe and Freemasonry and was the age of reason and enlightenment. That means that 
we human beings will solve our own problems we will move towards a fantastic future and we will build a new atlantis you know this was the great if you read any of the writings you will never hear anything like there once was a golden age and we must go back to it none of that it was never like that it was always progressive building better men shaping better civilization using science to become better learn uh, still in the mystery of god but using science using philosophy using logic using mathematics to push ourselves forward towards more perfection and more perfection until we finally can get there you know so that was always the case that i noticed yeah something like ever onward christian soldiers onward christian soldiers <laughs> and i i i think that one one thing i'll say brother bharat is that that the the world really does divide into regressive and progressive spirituality ideas you know regressive ideas are ones that predict a great golden age that once was and we are corrupted and we are sinners and we have fallen down and we are hopeless and it's a kind of gnostic idea you know and and we are you know in the face of god this is the end of time and ah, da, 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 all that rubbish but as a mason and as an architect i can tell you that the progressive idea is that we human beings will save this planet but we've got to have consciousness at that level that's all you know great now uh there's a comment from the the, the mischievous brother and, and most people know who this mischievous brother is but <laughs> he's he's a worshipful brother sip in our now he's the most mischievous character on earth So anyway he's got a comment for you he says we are all actors brother raja <laughs> to select us for the acting capability for your film as we would like to be part of that so if you have a- i will i will accept a few lakhs per role from each of you <laughs> right <laughs> lots of laudatory comments and uh, you know from people all across the globe we have got brethren from uh, all across the globe right now watching you and there are very laudatory comments uh there's a question from brother shan kulasingam he says brother raja dwarka harappa mohenjodaro are also old civilizations have they not had any influence on our civilizations today you know the we can't speak in terms like that the if we look at genetic history alone all the races of the world more or less genetically come out of india that means they came from africa crossed over into southern india and today if you go to villages in tamil nadu and kerala you will still find gene pools that go back 40 50 60 000 years bc you know but that old now those same people traveled to australasia they traveled to the caucasoid they formed relationships in china you know and genetic mutations occurred and people changed their skin tones their eyes their structure and if you look at northern india genetically it's a hybrid mix between indo persian in i'm talking now pure genetic scientific history it is indo persian mongol uh invaders of uh, turkestan you know all plus dravidian ancient indian all are there h1a you know that those are all there now did indian civilization go at these periods and affect everything yes buddhism was there at the court of alexandria no doubt about it but you cannot identify clearly pythagoras did come to india no doubt about that however what we are seeing is a revolution in thinking around 6th century bc that happens around the world in socrates and plato in confucius and daoism in china in buddha and mahavir and upanishads in india which is a revolution of self contemplation who am i and this revolution we masons are a product of that who am i question and what is my place in the divine plan that's what we have to remember so let's not look at whether or not harappa and and mahabharata and all are true and can affect the world no that's all fine who are you and what are you going to do to shape the next world that's coming this world yeah thank you raja in, in fact i think that also answers a que- another question this was from brother shrikandan 
from Malaysia. Uh, his question was, Brother Raja Chaudhary, it's a great honor to be present for your presentation. It was truly excellent. A question that I have is that you did not emphasize enough on the contributions of ancient India, the new Atlantis, or perhaps I missed it. I guess your previous answer would have covered this particular question to some extent. And uh, further, or another add-on question to this is brother, from Brother Silesh Gokul Singh from Mauritius. His question is, are there any connections between Atlantis and Lemuria, which is believed to be the Indian Ocean spanning from India to the southern tip of Africa? These, well, the, Lem the Lemurian myth is, uh, or, or the story of Lemuria, which is a favorite of the Tamil Dasam and the Tamil people also, is that there was a great landmass that went well beyond South India, all the way to Africa, Madagascar, all the way to Australasia. That was a great civilization thousands of years ago that because of the great floods and the great sinking separated from India and lost that great civilization and what is left of that civilization flourished in Tamil Nadu in the South. That is the theory. And it's a valid theory. There's no, there's no reason to doubt its potential historically. However, there's very not enough archaeological evidence and there's not enough uh, linguistic evidence to validate it because the Rig Veda is obsessed with the Saraswati River civilization. And the Saraswati River civilization runs from Afghanistan to southern Gujarat and Pakistan. So we, we are seeing multi-facets of civilizational activity going on all over the world. Lumeria had nothing to do with Atlantis, even though it could have been. Now, one of the theories was that in 10,500 BC, and this is a contested theory, but Graham Hancock and all are advocating it, that around 10,500 BC, there was a maritime civilization that spanned the whole world and included southern India, included uh, Peru, included Egypt, included many other countries around the world. And you see the relics in East Island, in southern India, in Gulf of Cambay. You see it all over the world, right? So this is still not archaeologically proven, but it is. these are all fascinating, interesting theories. Yep, thank you. Now, the next question is... Uh, this is from the naughty man himself, but it's not a naughty question. He says, when did the paths of the Rosicrucians and Freemasons get blurred and differentiated? So, you see, the, the problem was that Rosicrucianism was a spin-off from the activity of Hermeticism in Europe early on. So if you think about it, you know, uh, when the translations of the Corpus Hermeticum and all sprinkled through Europe, you get the Renaissance art, geometry, everything starts happening all over Europe. The church, of course, tries to control it. And a very famous guy called Giorno, Giorno Bruno sort of uh, proved that uh, the Corpus Hermeticum was written in the third century in Alexandria and not by thought in ancient Egypt. So that kind of crushed the Hermetic um, popularity at that time. And so when, the, when these, let's say, brothers like us saw this crushing of the great hermetic traditions, they felt the need to create a new secret society that would bring that knowledge back into a popular conversation. And that's where Rosicrucian comes into being around 1624, where you get this publishing of these pamphlets uh, that are published on walls in Paris and in Germany and other places. And a book is published and released called The, Chris the Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. Right, the great book. And this book is the Bible of alchemy and hermeticism and Rosicrucianism that we know today. It's an obscure book. If you try and read it, you, are, you, you will have no hair like me. You all will fall off trying to figure it out. But so then, so across Europe, you get this Rosicrucian kind of percolation of who is a Rosicrucian? Are you a Rosicrucian? Are you, you know, it was like a secret society that didn't even exist. Nobody knew it existed even, you know, where it was. But people like Bacon with the Rosicra and the helmets in England, people like the Rosicrucian societies and later Steiner and other, you know, Goethe in Germany and Steiner, they revived Rosicrucianism. So Rosicrucianism went into Freemasonry around the 1600s to 1650s to 1700s. And they became Rosicrucian. Scottish Rite went Rosicrucian, you know, went Rosicrucian. And so you see a very strong co-relationship between Scottish Rite and Rosicrucian 
ideas, the rose quack, you know, the whole idea comes into being there. And you also the Martinique, uh, Martinist uh, lodges of uh, that are known in Mauritius and elsewhere are also very Rosicrucian in their thinking, you know, very Rosicrucian. But Brother Aipur, I know that you are an expert at this area too, so you'll be looking at it. What do you think? <laughs> uh, talking of, uh, first of all, with Bruno, Giordano Bruno, uh, he also uh, ended up in England towards the end of his life. That's right. And uh, he was quite intimately connected with Oxford University for a long time. And he was involved in all sorts of uh, curious uh, enterprises. <laughs> He's a very interesting man. And, he uh, wanted to be John Dee, I think. He wanted to be like John Dee. You know? But if, uh, it's a fascinating life that he led. And as far as uh, Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry is concerned, um, uh, the, the modern version of it is, of course, the SRIA in England and the SRIS in Scotland. The Society is Rosicruciana in Anglia and Society is Rosicruciana in Scotia. So uh, you can become a member. The basic requirement is that you are a master mason. And uh, as far as the hermetic lodges are concerned, there is the uh, you know, HOM, uh, the Hermetic Order of Martinism, also in England, you can become a member there too. Incidentally, I'm a member of both, so it's Wonderful. both fascinating uh, uh, experiences for those who are interested esoterically. So, If I might just add there, brother, that the, the closest esoteric, non-Masonic teaching that is closest to the original Rosicrucianism was the teaching of Steiner and Goethe, Steiner in particular. And Steiner was, uh, uh, he organized a group philosophy called Anthroposophy in the 1920s and 30s in Germany. And if you get a chance, it is worth reading a book he wrote on the Rosicrucian initiation that will also help you in your Masonic Rosicrucian work as well. It's a very powerful treatise on, which includes, by the way, a meditation on an OM, A-U-M, was what they believe Christian Rosenkreuz bought back from the East was an OM meditation. Just for my brothers who think that India did not affect anything, I, Rosicrucianism I, I, meditates on OM. <laughs> at, at, this juncture, at, at this juncture, Brother Raja Chaudhary, I'd just like to interject, uh, just, just for it's a comment, uh, Rosicrucianism does not have any connection to Scottish Rite. We will talk about it a lot more. Uh, the next question is uh, from Brother Shehan Paris from Colombo. Uh, Brother Raja, the lock you mentioned in the triad, Bacon Lock and Newton, is this the same John Locke who also theorized about human emotions? And was he a Mason? No, he was a Rosicrucian. He was not a Mason because at that time, Freemasonry, the, the, the Grand Lodge had not been formed yet. So nobody was called a Mason. At that time, they were called other things. They were guild members or speculative members and things like that. But he was definitely a Rosicrucian. That Locke was a Rosicrucian, but he was a part of the Helmets, which was uh, the Bacon group that was formed. And then later, Royal Society as well. So yes, he was that Locke. And uh, Isaac Newton became the president of the Royal Society after Bacon, after Bacon and one, two, three others. Then came Isaac Newton. And uh, so Locke was a part of that, that cabal, that, that, group that came out of that period. And incidentally, Locke was a great inspiration for the American founding fathers also. Correct. There's a wonderful book, book on uh, which I will post to the group for you to share on the Masonic founding of the Americas that's worth reading. It's a wonderful book. I'll dig up the details for you. I'll send it to you. Talking of that, uh, next question, Raja, is concerning that. You know, this is from uh, Brother Rinesh Hegde. He said, was it the New Atlantis book a triatize and colonization? If yes, how does it justify the emergence of Washington, D.C. and Delhi as per your talk? I can understand Delhi as it was the British who chose the place. But Washington, D.C. was chosen by the Americans. And he's, he ends up by saying, not sure if my question makes sense. In other words, I think he's trying to question if the book is about colonization which was to the benefit of the English, why did the colonized people choose to develop on that subject? I understand. I understand. And, and most current thinking is that 
Bacon was a Republican and a revolutionary by nature. <laughs> he was not looking to continue the monarchy in any way. He wanted to build a democratic structure, even in England, which was not truly democratic at that time. You know, so I think that Bacon was trying to find a new place to do this experiment in, and America was the perfect place. But he figured that the only way he could do it was to persuade the powers to do it as colonization and then see what happens. You know, and I, you, you can understand he was being Machiavellian in his own way. He was looking at ways to get new places going that would then develop new ideas that would then become the new Atlantis. You know, this was the whole idea. Right. And Brother Ajay Reina from Delhi has a question. He says, unlike Washington, where masonry and architecture has been widely publicized, why was the New Delhi, or for that matter, any other city highlighted comparatively? I, I would lay it at the feet of the Congress Party in the early period of the 50s, because even though Motilal Gandhi was a Freemason, Nehru was more raised by theosophists and other, he was much more of an atheist and he did not believe in the ideas of uh, architect of the universe or anything that his father had believed in. So he was a more parlor, uh, um, sort of uh, uh, socialist socialist you know and uh, he was a he was he was a he, he was a parlor socialist and if we look at it from that point of view the ideals of the democracy that nehru took on from gandhi and made his own were very socialist and secular and atheistic in their nature right and so to support the freemasonic ideals at that time would have been antithetical to what he was trying to do if I may add, I think he was uh, more of this influenced by the Fabian Society. Fabian Society. That's what I meant. I was looking for the word. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. Uh, yeah but uh, talking of the cities uh, being uh, inspired by Masonic architecture, it's not just New Delhi. Brother Richard Mehta has done a wonderful presentation on the city of Mumbai. Yes. And uh, he's, uh, he's promised to do a similar uh, uh, paper on Chennai and Calcutta. I'm waiting for that, but Brother Richard has a, something known as the starting trouble. So, so he, he, Can I just add one comment on this point, which is that the, the difference between Chennai and Bombay and Calcutta is that Masonic symbolism was encoded into a city that was already in activity, right? just like Paris and London, right? These were already existing ancient cities that did not have Masonic generating principles. But Washington and Delhi were generated with Masonic intention, which is the only difference I would point out. Right, right. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, next question uh, from Vic uh, Amrit. Uh, Before I ask my question, I would like to inform Brother Raju Tauri that I'm a huge fan of his work. I followed his talks in the Upanishads, the Eye of Horus, Pineal Gland, and Chakras on YouTube. If I manage to travel to Gurgaon again, I hope I will have the pleasure of meeting him, Brother Raja, for a cup of chai or a beer. Brother Vic, you will have to travel very fast because Brother Raja is relocating to America in a couple of months. In August, August 7th. <laughs> uh, Who is that brother? Way, Who is that brother? Vic Amartalingam from uh, Malaysia. Okay, good to meet you, brother. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you one day. First question is, there's an idea that Shakespeare was actually multiple people writing under one pseudo. Yes. What are your thoughts? No, I believe that. I believe that he was the product of the Helmets. And the Helmets were a secret society that was formed to influence the masses in these ideals and this republicanism that they were thinking about and questioning monarchies and absolute monarchies. And, and these Marlowe, De Vere, Shakespeare... M many believe that Shakespeare actually did not exist or he was a puppet of this group. But uh, the, 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 the writings of Marlowe and De Vere are very similar to later Shakespearean work. And so it was an amalgamation of the, the feeling is that it was an amalgamation of a secret cabal or group that came together to help churn the new civilization, you know. Yeah. And uh, in, in fact, even uh, Baron Verulam, uh, Francis Bacon himself was also considered as having contributed to that, uh, you know, that uh, 
entire uh, folio. If, if he did do that personally, he never. There's a man who probably never slept then because he generated so much. <laughs> I read about him that he was part of that cabal. That's right. That's right. Uh, of course, Ed, Edward de Vere was the Earl of Oxford. Correct. They uh, most believe that Edward de Vere's writing influences were the strongest on Shakespeare. Marlowe was less so, but but it's a whole other. There's a whole bunch of research on this going on. We don't know yet for sure. Then Wick's second question: The Declaration of Independence spoke about free men and equality. I believe at that point in time, some Freemasons would have owned slaves, mm -hmm. but the freeing of slaves didn't happen until the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 under President Lincoln, who was not even a Mason. Mm -hmm. The question is, why wasn't slavery made illegal at the time of the Declaration of Independence, which was signed by a majority of Freemasons? Good question. Good question. And there was a very interesting take on this, was that Thomas Jefferson had initially proposed that it be put there, that all men, including slaves, be treated as equal. But because so many of the original founding fathers were landowners who would lose their entire fortunes if they gave up their tobacco and their cotton trade, they would uh, they they tempered it and tried to introduce it, but it wasn't introduced till a hundred almost a hundred years later by the, the proclamation of, of uh, by Lincoln and others. You know, so it was a very difficult thing to sell at that time. If you were a, a gentleman farmer Republican in America, getting rid of your slave meant destroying your economy, your business completely, and. Not easy to sell at that time. Yeah, in fact, uh, having uh, you know kept that in mind, you will also remember that uh, so-called universal franchise was not a concept which was there in, right from the beginning, uh, as far as America was concerned. Neither was it there in Europe or England. The only country which got up independent and started with universal franchise, our uh, other first country was India in 1947. Hmm. They did not put any codicils, they did not put any clauses, they just said a citizen of India has a vote. They as a secular whole, correct, right. I think that, that is something remarkable. You know, it, it is funny because, you know, the in Britain, for example, the anti-slavery movement happened quite soon after the War of Independence. You know, the William Wilberforce and all were just a few years later. You know, it wasn't like... Uh, uh, so I think that intellectually it took about 30, 40 years for the ideas from England of anti-slavery to percolate back into America, you know, and that began the Northeast movements and all that, you know. So I think that there was a movement, but there was no, see, you have to remember that if you were a, a gentleman, a white gentleman in 17, 1600s America or England, the black man and the Indian man was a product was not a human being really, you know. And unfortunately, it's true, but we only became human a little later, you know. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so it's just, uh, you're, you're putting yourself in the time of that period. It's fair enough. Uh, Brother Shanmugam, uh, Dr. Shan Subaya from Kuala Lumpur, his question, Brother Raja, in your journey from Hermeticism through to Christianity, you placed Buddha behind and after Jesus Christ. Certainly in terms of chronology, Buddha came 250 years before Jesus Christ. And certainly Jesus had some inspiration from Buddha's teachings and principles, which could have overshadowed or foreshadowed Christ's teachings and which Jesus would have effectively used in his own teachings. Would you care to comment on that? I'm not, a, I, I'm, I'm a student of this and I'm not convinced by that argument, even though it may have been the, see, when Alexander went back from India, he took gymnosophists, who later we call Buddhist monks and other monks, with him to, you know, he never went back to Greece himself. The Hellenistic civilization was there. And, but by the time Alexandria was there, you know, I, I would say that the dialogue in the marketplaces of Alexandria or the Greek Empire or the Roman Empire were much more diverse than one teacher influencing everything. You know, there was a lot going on. And Buddhism was just a, another one of those in the marketplace. Now, whether Buddha was influenced by Buddhism, no evidence. Because 
The closest we have seen is from the Nag Hammadi library of the translations of the Gospels of Thomas and the Gospels of Mary Magdalene and the Gospels of Judas, which were heretical texts, and the Corpus Hermeticum later. And what we see there is a much more Zoroastrian type of religion than necessarily one of Buddhism or of Hinduism. So I, I would beg to differ on that, that's all. Okay. Um, coming up, now that this, uh, the, okay, brother Rafael Santos from Madeira Island in Portugal. Uh, he's, he just uh, has a wonderful session and he's having some audio and video connectivity problems. So he's not able to log on and ask you a question. Maybe he will get in touch with you later. Um, then, uh, Oh, Brother Vic has come back and says he does travel to Seattle every other year. So hopefully from there he'll drop over to where you are once you settle down in America. Yes, I'm moving to Princeton. So I'll be living on the Masonic line. Ah. <laughs> right. The Garden State, New Jersey. Uh, to add to Brother Raja Chaudhary about Bombay and Chennai, this is from Rinesh Hegde. He says, we can add a design forceful and existing design and explain the points. The symbol of Om and Cross have already been added to these cities and each point will have a meaning. And there is a line in the lost symbol that mentions that you can draw any line on a city and you will find it to draw something interesting. Oh, okay. Not exactly a question, a comment. So I think, brethren, we have reached the end of the question. I don't see any further questions, mostly comments, auditory comments, as I mentioned. Brother Raja, you have hit the proverbial sixer. <laughs> Wonderful indeed. Uh, thank you once again. It was an honor and a privilege to be here with you. Thank you, sir, for having me. I was very honored for, for a junior Mason like me to be given this privilege. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Oh, I, I saw a raised hand. Brother Richard, the Beta has raised his hand. Brother Richard, would you like to say something? Brother Richard, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? I like your beard, brother. It's getting bigger and bigger by the day. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much, brother Raja. Lovely, lovely, uh, lovely lecture. Very interesting. I, I have a lot of questions, but I will only stick to one major question that I thought, you know, could be pertinent to this. We spoke about the platonic solids, correct? And with that retrospect, could there be a way that this could be associated with light? light passing through these platonic solids in a specific order because as you notice you can put each platonic solid into each other so a yes, purification process of and light and so could there be some connection to that or what would your opinion be on that I, I would suggest to you that the alchemical process of making glass in that way did not come till later right we did not have an optical glass industry in platonic times, right? So it would not have been possible unless there were natural gemstones that could refract light in some way. And that was the only way. It would only have been done by natural stones or crystals in some way. So the people were obsessed with crystals and to see what color refracted out of it. And they didn't call it refraction. They thought it was power. They thought a power was coming out so that you could put a beam in. But what we find is more common with... Platonic solids is the music of the spheres, is sound. Right? And this goes back to ancient Egypt as well and to India as well. The idea of mantra, the idea of Kabbalah, of sound, of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet making up the name of God. You know, these are, so sound was more sacred to this esoteric tradition than light. Okay, but then light is a form of purity, you know, so could light be yes. being a spiritual form of purifying the body, maybe an alchemical way that this spiritual body, the I am, always, could be purified always. from the, you know. Always, always. In fact, maybe a way to def define that, uh, to find that divine light, you know, a way to uh, siphon it to a pure filtration through ourselves, you know. Could that have been an idea? Because we are working with the sun over here. And all these cities are placed with so much precision with respects to the sun and the planetary alignments. There could be a lot more to the visual aspect as well. Not just refraction, of course, or, or mirrors, but something much deeper than that, like Surya Vigya. I, I think we, we do have a solar cult 
and we do have that goes back to very ancient civilization gopekli tepe has solar orientation you know um, okay. um, cities in turkey cities in you know all the ancient sacred feminine cities are also oriented to the equinoxes you know and to solstices right so this is not uh, yes i agree but they could also have been ways of calendification and symbolic movements of time right way of time keeping so i think that it's a wonderful area to explore and it's definitely worth doing but god the one tradition where god was always light was ahura mazda in the zoroastrian tradition and that's worth looking as an influence into persia and yeah. You know, absolutely absolutely were you able to uh, find richard, a few of the... richard richard can they get others to talk also absolutely, please absolutely absolutely we'll talk Thank again you. next time brother and next Thank time you. please register huh, richard richard right. i did so i did register okay uh, brother and um, i think we, i don't see any other raised hands so i, I don't see any questions as such uh, i think we have come to the when every end of this particular session but before i be close Uh, I have a small appeal to make you, brother. Uh, there is a brother from Salem, uh, Vishnu brother uh, Sri Kamata, very charitable man. Uh, he has called me up earlier this morning and said that he would like to donate this oxygen machines, uh, you know, five each in Chennai and Bombay, for uh, though you know the distressed because of this COVID situation. So he has wanted to know if we could. put him in touch with somebody who actually manufactures these and could give him at a manufacturer's price because you would like to purchase it directly from the manufacturer and donate it to the hospital government hospitals in chennai and mumbai so if any of you have any information about this please do get in touch with me separately and i would like to pass on this information to brother srikant mehr i think it's a laudable uh, enterprise on his part so let's see if we can support him in that uh brother and nothing more to say except to say once again a very sincere thanks to all of you for being with us on this eighth episode a huge thanks to all of you for the questions and the comments and uh, i also look forward to your help in um, our uh, this new idea of uh, you know connecting our physical activity with some laudable cause and also those of you can help brother raja in producing his movie is coming up if i might just say that to, if you want to see anything further about the movie just go to americasfirstguru.com and you will find it all there right brother raja once again thank you very much for uh, sharing your uh, knowledge and your zeal and enthusiasm with us I wish you well in all your endeavors and uh, especially the the movie that you are about to produce and uh, rest assured we will come to your assistance in some way or form very soon Thank you, our brethren. Thank you, Vada Umashankar. Thank you, brethren. Good night. Take care and stay safe.